Energy modes here. One, two, three, four. Okay. So I started. So things that we, this talk will be about things I wish I had known when I became a remote developer. And some of the good things, some of the bad things, some of the other things. And yes, there are good, bad, and the ugly. Just like working in an office. So <coughs> why pe people actually become remote? So some just want to find a dream job. So even if you live in a London, you might not be able to find the dream job you want. If you live in some some smaller place like York, I believe you're you're even more limited, right? So some people don't like the congestion, the commute to work. So I've heard of someone taking five hours each day to go to work and back. Five hours every day. So. Yeah, that can be hard. Some people don't want to work from nine to five, want to have some time management of their own. Like, well, I don't know, I prefer working in the afternoons instead of the morning. So why not find a US company that's okay with that because that's their time. Or maybe an Asian company if you like to work during night. But some of the things are like, who would like to get this remote position, working from a beach? Uh, let's get the hands up. So, okay, one liar, two liars, three liars, three, four. So, some people are lying, not, not to us as much to themselves. Some people want just a change. Tired of the boring office work, uh, living in the city or something. And some people just want freedom. Nothing more, nothing less. But why companies hire remotes? <laughs> so most people think it's about the money. Oh, sorry, money. Uh, but yes, most of the time it's about the money. But not in sense of companies wanting to be cheap. But so how many of you here drive a car? Okay, how many of you drive a Ferrari? So no hands? So you're all cheap? Just to the weekend. Oh, okay, so, okay. so we have a half. <laughs> so it is about the money, but not being cheap. Uh, for some. For some companies, they want the cultural diver diversity. What do you think about uh, building a global product by using only people from Yorkshire or South Africa or Malaysia or Argentina. It doesn't make that much sense. There's a lot of cu cultural differences. So you want a diverse team. But also finding rare talent. Companies previously, when they would find a person that's so important to them, they would sometimes even build offices around that person in that country, in that city. Because that person wasn't willing to move somewhere or wasn't able to move somewhere. That's not something that a lot of companies can do. But also when we talk about being remote, it's nothing new. All the big companies have offices all around the world. It's not that IBM is only somewhere in the US. They have offices everywhere. Microsoft as well, Intel as well, for years. So it's nothing new, it's just the scale thing. So, who am I? My name is Miro Sorton. I'm a senior developer and I also work as a trainer. And I come, and I come from this co small little country called Croatia, I live here in Zagreb. I'm not sure how, how good people are with geography. So how did my remote story start? I really hated the idea of being remote for years. I had a lot of offers, but I didn't like the idea of working from home and a lot of other things. But back in 2014, I joined a startup in Zagreb that about six weeks after me joining, got into an accelerator in Berlin. 
And literally, I had a ticket for next Monday to go to Berlin. And our offices are, were in Berlin since then. Even a month later, I couldn't stay in Berlin because I have family, my friends are in Zagreb. I, I'm not 20 something that I can just, oh yes, Monday, Berlin, my new hometown. So I came back to Zagreb and it was the middle of the summer. And the only thing I could do for work was actually work from home, nothing more. And the accelerator ended, and like after three or four months, but the team decided to keep, uh, to stay in Berlin. And actually, the only thing that I was able to do was continue working from home. And this is how I became a remote developer. It was just circumstances. So some of you might ask, well, why didn't you just change a company? I should love the company, the product, the team, the, everything that we did. I really loved it. So just finding another company because I have to work from a remote location felt a bit stupid. I liked the freedom. I really liked how I could concentrate on the problems I, I work on so I can finally smoke. I'm a pretty heavy smoker, so that was a really nice feature. Uh, if I wanted to go and do, I don't know, shop, grocery shopping or go to a bank or something, I just go and do it. Uh, you wouldn't believe how clean your apartment is when you're working from home because so I either have to work on this shitty feature or I can clean the whole apartment. <laughs> so what do you think what did I uh, pick? But for eight hours a day, that can be hard because you feel home alone, very easily isolated. And it sometimes grows to some frustration because so what I noticed and what I spoke to other friends who are remoting, so when you go out of the office, you lose all of the gossip, all of the can you something, and you get really productive but really, really productive, and it's just going like high, but then at some point that cool features are done, you have stupid maintenance, you have things that you really don't want to work, and then, oh, well, let's, kill the, uh, let's clean the kitchen, things happen, and you get frustrated. You can't share feelings with others because, oh, God damn, this doesn't work or something because they don't feel your pain. But one of the important things is that remote doesn't mean you have to work from home. So it took me about a year and a half to find three friends and get them office. So out of four of us, two of them worked in the same company. Luca and I worked for our own. And this is Luca's daughter that decided to join us one day because in remote, you can bring your own daughter to work. So you can try something like that if you're scared of working from home because if you have children it's not really easy to like find a place and space like not to be bothered uh, with daily life but maybe you can just go sometimes to a bar and work from there this is really uh, popular in the states you just go to Starbucks and you're there from nine to five or whatever or find a co-working place. You can often rent the whole office, maybe just a table or something. You can go there when you want, when you need. Because it's really, really important to find the work-life balance. So for me, that was one of the hardest things. When I first rented an office from a friend, well, a company of a friend, they use to work with like the US and most of my teams are EU, are European based. So I would be there from nine to five. They would come at like 1 p.m. and work like till nine. But I really loved at 5 p.m. when I just shut down my laptop and say, now I'm going home. That 10 minute ride by car was one of the best feelings I ever had. Like, now I'm done with my work, now I can go out. Because when you work from home, 
you'll go in the morning <laughs> yeah let's go shopping so then you will start two hours later so let's do this and it's already noon so let's go for a lunch and then it's 2 p.m so you decide to do something else and it's 4 p.m and you still have eight hours of work to do which means up to midnight then about five or six some of your friends call you for a coffee or a beer and then you go there and then your work stops at 3 a.m and that can be really really bad One of the misconceptions is that remote means freelancing. I'm not a freelancer. I'm a member of a team. For all four companies that I used to work or work for, now I'm a team member. I'm not a hired gun. I don't come for some time. I'm an employee that's remote. And you can be too, because a lot of people think that you can't be a part of a team. Yes, you can, because if you do some onboarding, which I did with most of my teams, you take a week or two on the location, you see a new city, which is nice because especially, usually they pay for it, so you can see a new city that you have never been to, uh, you meet your teammates. You have to do the first, like the initial connection with people. Uh, mails, Skypes, uh, things like that will not cover that. It's much better that when you can do that initial connection. And like we did some modeling. And you have to keep communicating with people. Because you can't be a part of a team by coming at 9 and just doing your work and then just go home. Oh, to the other room. You have to keep communicating to feel like a part of the team. So what, some of the issues that I had in one of the companies was I would find out that two hours ago was, the f was a new person in the company. Like everybody else in the office knew because they were talking, gossiping about it. Oh, yes, that new person, but nobody told me. And they were like, hi, I'm here. Who are you? Like, and that's person joining my team. Not the company, my team. But it's much worse when you're trying to find a person that just left the company last week. That very high paid person that everybody said was, was going to solve all the problems was laid off like a few weeks later. And everybody knew except you. And you were pretty in like, so I sent him an email. He's not responding. I'll just send another one and then like literally next week you find out that person is not in the company anymore. Or deadlines have been moved up. Which is something that everybody but you knows because they had a meeting. Oh, or the roadmap changed. That, that was nice as well. So try to use tools like Slack or HipChat or something to communicate everything, but literally everything. So uh, my second job was in Helsinki and I joined, jo I came there and we had some team building. So a lot of developers were there <coughs> and all of the remotes were talking to the locals from the same room about going to lunch over hip chat. I was like, what? Like finally you're all in one place and you're using HipChat to say where to go to lunch. Yeah. What? Then I figured out that there were people for lunch in the other room as well. But also, they keep everything in there. Everything. And that's really, really important. Don't try to talk amongst yourselves in the office. Try to write it down. Because then everybody knows. Even the people that are sick or on vacation, they'll come back and see all of it. Of course, try not to write it in a random with all the memes and all the other things. <laughs> try doing daily stand-ups. Like five to 10 minutes every morning. What have I done? What am I doing today? Just so that everybody knows 
what's been done. <coughs> and like literally screen uh, with the cameras. So this is our, uh, this was our weekly meeting. Hour to two hours every week where we would do the retrospective of the last week, planning for the next week. You can also screen pair program. It's not as good as pair programming, but it's really, really nice to get a better bond between you and somebody. Because when you talk one-to-one, -one, you get to uh, create connections. Do team retreats. So one of my previous teams for a launch of a mobile app or mobile web went for two weeks to a villa in Ibiza. So that the whole remote team, the whole product team goes there works on the launching of it, but also builds the team itself. Everybody loved it. So let's go to some of the tips, like please beware of cultural differences. <laughs> so uh, most of the time you'll have people, not from around the whole world, but maybe around Europe. And there's even a big difference in sense of, <laughs> so, have you ever worked with somebody from the south of Europe? Anybody? Okay. Somebody from the north of Europe? Okay. Noticed some differences in voice, pitch, and aggression, and maybe we could do that feature. Sounds reasonable. So I have a story from friends of mine. So the three of them work in Croatia, and their business partner is a German. And it took them about two years for the German guy to figure out that they're not aggressive. They're just loud. They don't mean nothing bad. It's just the pitch of the voice. And it can cause a lot of trouble, especially to northerners when they work with southerners. But the, on the other way as well, you don't want the business manager the things or product owner, the things that, that feature is okay. It's gonna bring us millions. Okay, we could do it, maybe. And they're actually ecstatic about the idea of doing that because it's gonna bring them millions, but they're just, okay, let's do it. And in the Balkans, we have the F word that we usually use very often, like instead of good morning. So I had issues where people misunderstood my comments with aggression or something like that, and it wasn't nice. Like, but I know that English have similar uh, four-letter wording in the normal conversation style, so my suggestion is don't do it with the, like the Northerners, like the Swedes, Finns, Norwegians and stuff, or Germans, they don't get it that nicely. <laughs> Another thing is time versus results. So when you become remote, like when you work in the office, they just look when you come in and when you leave. Like, okay, I was at work at 9 a.m., 5 p.m., I'm leaving. Like, you can maybe notice that none of the computers are on, so like, yeah, only three more hours of not doing anything. But when you're remote, the only thing that people see is the output. Well, not the only thing, but if they want to see what you did, what they, in last a month or two or six, they look through the output. Not your time sheet that you came at nine and left at five. But work from home, is also a keyword for not doing anything that day. So you have to be motivated sometimes to do it. And also very disciplined. Like, because in the office, if you have to work on a shitty bug or feature that you don't like, you're just going to go through it because you don't have much something better to do. But you have a TV at home or Netflix or Facebook or friends or coffee or something else. So it can be really hard.
few months into my remoting, I started tracking my time. So I never share my uh, time logs with the team. It's simply and only for me and my recollection. Because what did happen a few times was that at 5 p.m., I thought that I did eight hours of work. Actually, what I did was like three hours of work because it was just something very hard and I just decided to do anything else. So it's really important for you to know how much you did. Uh, even sometimes I do go to like uh, marathons where sometimes I just notice that it's, oh, 5 a.m. So I have been working for 18 hours straight because it was a cool feature to do. And knowing that you just worked 18 hours is really important. In the office, you will notice by people just going away and everything else. At home or in your own office, you don't have the same things because with freedom comes responsibility. And you really have to be aware of it. Uh, one of the hardest, one of the also hard things is you have to be async. You shouldn't expect people to answer you now. So if you have a question, be ready that it might take them a few hours to answer because you don't have that person to like, hey, can you help me with this? Hey, hey. But also another problem is they don't know how busy you are. So let's say that you work in an office with 10 other people and you have a question. You can look, you can put your head up and look who's really busy and who's not. And then see if somebody's coming from a toilet or a coffee break or going for a smoke. Hey, 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 can you help me with this? Instead of bothering somebody that's really, really busy with like production is down or some critical feature or something really hard. As a remote, you can't. And the problem is they don't know either. So sometimes it would happen to me to have like five different people asking me things on Slack while I was working on something. And I'm like, okay, so, okay, now let's start answering people. No, be async. Decide every two hours I'm going to communicate with others. Or every hour. You don't have to be in real time. But I think that's a really good thing for an office too, because if you ever were like a team lead or something or are, you know how hard it is to do anything when people are poking at you in queue. Like you just get rid of one person, then the second one comes. Hey, I have a question too. <laughs> Try to communicate on and off. Like this is a really stupid one, but when you come to the office, you usually come and say good morning, right? Why don't you do it on Slack? If you're going home, why don't you say just goodbye like you say when you're leaving an office? Nothing more like of that. Like, hey, I have to go to a bank, to something. Just say, hey, I have to go somewhere, I'll be back in two hours. Just like you do it in the office. It's as simple as that, but you have to write it instead of say it. But it's not for everyone. And it's not for everyone. Because... I don't think that it's for inexperienced people. So like inexperienced, not in a remote, but like for juniors. Because it's really, really hard to have trust. Because you can't establish trust with a person that might be just learning your language or your framework or your something and actually didn't do anything for the last two weeks and they pretend to fix a bug or learn how something works and then you're never sure what's happening. So like if you're a senior PHP developer, go for a remote position. If you want to move to Python or some other language or some other framework, I wouldn't suggest going remote. Some companies will of course say, hey, we are using Haskell or something that nobody's using. So yes, we are ready to pay for you're you not knowing, but that's a bit of a different thing. So why don't you just try it in your company, like next week? 
Why don't you try to work from home one day? Maybe, maybe one day a week is too much. One day a month. When you have to concentrate on something, why don't you try? It's a rainy day. Why would you commute? There's a big crash on the highway, motorway. It's going to take you two hours to go to work. Why don't you just stay home? Maybe you're having a delivery or a repairman. Why would you take a day off when you can work from home? Like, probably that delivery is going to take 10 minutes of your life, but you still have to be at home. So do you really want to take a vacation for that? Like in Amsterdam, it's pretty normal to order everything. So nobody who lives in Amsterdam, well, the central Amsterdam, has a car. So whatever they want, they have to order it. And they have to wait for the deliveries. So it was pretty normal for people to just to say, hey, waiting for a delivery today, going to work from home. Or it's raining, going to work from home. Or storm, going to work from home. So maybe instead of relocating, maybe you really love where you live. Try it. So just a short recap. So remote doesn't mean that you have to work from home. It doesn't mean that you have to freelance. You can be a part of a team. Watch out for the cultural differences. They can get you into a lot of trouble. And it's just really not for everyone in every company. Thank you very much. So as Clinton announced, instead of doing like a Q&A, and I have a bit more time than I originally thought, I decided to do like a short panel, short discussion. So do you have any questions? Like anybody? Okay, one, two. So let's assemble a small, small panel here. Okay, let's stand. Who's interested in panel? Come here. Let's talk about being remote or not being remote. If somebody hates the idea of being remote, shout. Yeah, that's not solid enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth a try. Is it what was your time? question? Um, so I'm a coach. I'm working with remote developers quite a lot of the time. Um, I work with a company that's hired in maybe people from Kiev or Hungary. The current client I'm working with has all remote developers. How do you as a developer learn and improve your skill? Um, you're not, it doesn't sound like you're pair programming with anyone or sharing desktops. How do you improve? I think it's, that part is still personal. Okay. How do you train people in a company? It's the same thing. So the company will have to arrange for training yeah. for you? Yeah. So if you want, if, look at them the same, same way. So like if you want to do a training on testing or some new language or some new framework or something, you would usually get a trainer and do like a three day or five day workshop or something like that. Buy them a plane ticket and get them into your office. Or do it in their office, if they have an office. Team retreats are also a good time to maybe do team building and education as well. So you do spend, do you spend time flying in and out of yeah. offices occasionally? Yeah. Right. So in about 18 months, I spent more than a month in Amsterdam. In a year, more than a month in Helsinki. And in Berlin, more than a month in a year. So it's pretty normal, and none of these destinations are that far away. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I have an issue with the trust issue. Um, so what I'm seeing is there is a lot of, of a lack of confidence in employees. This is something that I'm experiencing, at least in Germany, a lot. Um, the remote work is, is not something in Germany. You're not going to get remote work. That's pretty much here. Um, what I'm seeing though is even at the stand-ups in the morning with German clients, you know exactly there is a developer that is not doing anything, but is making it up all the time. This happens all the time. So it, I don't think that is a remote or not remote thing. That's the trust issue in general. It doesn't have any effect on the remote or not remote situation. That's my stance on that. Okay, could be. 
Um, I, so let's say that I'm the company. I wouldn't feel comfortable taking some random junior developer on board as a remote. I, I have two junior developers working for me, so uh, it's working real fine, but you need to coach them. You need to be there. So you need to be, um, I think, the, the right definition would be you need to be interruptible. That's basically what you need to be there. Yeah. That's your job, it's teaching them. But how big is the team? We're talking about just the one three junior developers. Yeah. We're not talking about a huge team, of course. But how would you put those two junior developers into a team of 10 seniors? You don't want a team of 10 people working on a project. You okay, want six. this. Yeah, it's already too big already. You're already going <coughs> way over the limit of communication causing the project being a mess of spaghetti already. I mean, so regardless of the experience level, that's too many people on the okay, project. that's true as well. Either dedicate one of those six to be interruptible. Right. Yeah, but, but you still can't know if the person is actually working or just learning the new framework. That is work, though. I would be willing to get my juniors to spend the month paid on just experimenting with a new framework rather than having them right away build something that will need to be rewritten later. Um, I first myself built stuff that had to be rewritten and if I went to a conference, learned something, talked to somebody that was experienced and spent maybe a week of doing research instead, that same feature would have been much better, much more efficient. And I, again, I don't think it spans over the topic of remote or not, that's basically Given, um, I'm, on, I'm still standing here, can I share a story? Of course. Okay, of course. Um, so if anybody wants to join in, uh, there was a lady working from Kiev um, with a team who's based in London. So they've got a few Kiev devs, and this team of about 15 people, so it's quite big and beautiful team, worked really well. Um, when they started, they couldn't get all the devs they wanted. So they were particularly missing somebody with JavaScript knowledge, um, and particularly they knew they wanted to do um, React, mm -hmm. and they didn't have anyone with React. But she had some JavaScript skills, a few. She was primarily a back-end dev with a few JavaScript skills. So I said, you know, if you can just knock something up, if you could just anything, just to show that the back-end is working, that would be really useful. Because then at least we'll be able to get some feedback on it, we'll be able to show progress on it, we'll know it's working when we can put the front end on. Um, and she did an awesome job. So she's having to refresh her JavaScript skills at the same time as she's checking in. And OK, there were a few mistakes and a few misunderstandings and she's not used to doing that front end work um, but it served the purpose of showing that her back end worked and the, that this back end that everybody was starting to play into as well so if I had somebody who was working remotely I would want to see that they were at least trying something and checking in every so often even if it was wrong and if somebody's not checking in I want to ask how okay is it for them to be wrong because if it's not okay for them to be wrong, they're going to be sitting there freezing and not willing to, to make that commitment to, and show that they're making progress. That's the, the interruptible part. Um, I personally even interrupt them if I don't get questions. That's one thing that I do. Um, I saw there's no progress. Um, do we need some help? Do we need to prep program for a couple hours? We do the screen sharing thing. But we sit together, if there is, and an being stuck, that's, that's the idea of the stand-up meeting in the morning. The being stuck. That's why you do the stand-up meeting. It's not about who needs what and what kind of progress I'm doing. It's about where am I stuck, where do I need help. It's not about telling everyone, look, I'm so awesome, I built this new thing. It's about, I'm stuck, can somebody please help me? And it should last 15 seconds per person. <laughs> There's also never like a that. fail fast about yeah. that time working on something. If you've got a 10 day task, yeah. if you can show something even if it fails after one day, yeah. you can see, the rest of the team can see if you're going in the right direction on it, could offer to help on fix yeah. what, whatever causes, causes it to fail, to renegotiate the API signatures if it's not set in stone at this point. But with regular check-in, 
even for something that isn't yet in a working state, you're demonstrating not only that you are progressing with the work, but you're demonstrating what you've achieved and whether it will work or not is something the rest of the team can see. And you're in a position to change the direction or to refactor it quickly before the end of that 10 day period when you do your final check in. And if you've not been communicating, if you've not been checking in periodically, until then, it comes as a shock to everyone when it doesn't work. So, any of you um, working remotely encourage people to check in on a branch even if it's broken? Yeah, and I do it even though I work out of the office. I know you shouldn't check in on branch, but if I was working remotely with people, I'd want to do that. I, I always uh, suggest to check in and push eagerly because I do incremental reviews. Exactly. Even yeah. if it's broken, keep doing and we decide on the direction as we go. Uh, juniors are called juniors because they can't take the architectural decisions, the design decisions behind a complete piece of software. So that's exactly what they need guidance. So you can, you know, tell them like, oh, we need a method that does this after they checked in some API that is just this mash together for each loop with thousand switches. You know. I'll always push code to GitHub whether it's lunchtime or the end of the day, even if it's broken. On the principle of the 37 bus factor. <laughs> if I get knocked down by the number 37 bus in my lunch hour when I nip out for lunch ah, okay. or overnight, the code is still there in its non working but half written state for someone else to take over. And as long as it's just on a branch, it's just on a branch. Mm -hmm. A short so bit. Purely on a Any questions? Purely on a branch. So, Mark, okay, Michael. So, because it's working involve me as an individual. What about having two co-located teams that are remote from each other that have their own opinions and their own ways of doing things? Um, so for example, we're both working on an iOS project, one team starts writing Objective-C, one team starts writing Swift, and they just independently made that decision. How do you align those teams? I have not been in that situation. That's how microservices are born. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have not got James Madison. Trivago worked that yes. way. Each team makes its own choices about what tool sets they want to use, what languages they want to use for the chunk of code that's been assigned to them. Very much a microservices architecture. Didn't and to be honest, that. Hmm? didn't they just follow that route? I have no them. idea, but I'm quite possibly. I would hate to manage that. Yeah, well, they you, they you buy a product. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. You, you could get that in the, in a, if they were in the same building. Like, press go and send, send forward on top to Even in the same room. Yeah, we are yeah. to, to make <laughs> You're going to have A and B. You're going to get that. Uh, oh, that's, that's what there was another not. question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, okay. it's not related to remote, for them being, being remote. I think it is amplified by being remote because if they're in the same building, yeah, but that, 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 I feel like they, they would have the remote. same problem. I have worked remotely when um, I was coaching team in China and we were working with some Indian devs with the product owner back here in London, but in London, um, so here in the UK. And the Chinese and Indian teams, we both have monitors at the end of the desk. This was before the days of Slack and HipTrack. So we just had monitors at the end of the desk with a camera on. It was on all the time. So the table would go down to the monitor and then you'd see the other table. And we could drink tea together and talk together and um, if you wanted to get somebody's attention you could just shout through and want to can, can we kind of join on Skype or something like that and then we'd be able to chat. Um, I do like so Lord British, the guy who runs the company that did Ultima Runda World who works out of New York because he likes New York, his entire team is in San Francisco and he actually has a robot avatar that wanders <laughs> around the office oh, yeah. and apparently is stuffed hate it because it's so quiet. They <laughs> <laughs> up behind them when they're not looking and peer over their shoulder and they'll suddenly hear this voice say, that code doesn't look right. <laughs> so they actually attach bells to the robot <laughs> so they could hear it coming. <laughs> I was just going to say, Mark, would you trust your junior devs to work at home a day a week? A day a week? No, no, I, they are working remotely. Oh, they are? Full time. Okay. Yes, I, I met them two times. Oh, this is the road? You no, know, those are 
people that work for me have nothing to do with Rove. Oh, okay. um, but uh, even with Rove, I'm working with James. And that Rove is... And we, we just do like a sync up and we have a Slack channel and then we ping each other and then, you know, half an hour later you get a response because somebody else was busy or whatever. It works fine. It's, it's working really, really well. But um, you must be on the same wavelength. If you have something like a scenario where you have two teams with different opinions, they hate each other, happens on the same building, in the same floor, or even across the room, that happens, um, you are going to get a software architecture that reflects the team. This is Conway's law. And it's pretty much like that. You're going to have different components that talk to each other in the software that depend on the structure of the team. But it has nothing to do with the actual physical location of the team. It's more about the ideology of people working on the project. Um, yeah. There was another question. Well, I was going to say, on the subject of robot avatars, uh, last time I worked with the remote developer, we kept the cardboard on the pattern of it next to our desk. And it worked really well because we thought about it a lot more. And when we did audio, it was we did Skype for all of us. So we stand up. We all looked at the. Oh, obviously, you in audio course, it just means you keep them more in, in your mind and you think back and you make decisions more than you otherwise. It's my dedication, so it's good. Yeah. 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 That's one thing on the wavelength, indeed. I'm currently working on a team in Germany. As I said, in Germany, this thing with the remote work doesn't exist. It's something that is more like an exception because somebody has a son or whatever. So there are reasons to stay at home rather than being at home being a normal thing. For example, in the Netherlands now, it's becoming legal to just require things in the contract to stay at home it's just like uh, a certain amount of days um, but um, again uh, you need to have a team that understands that people are not here that they need to be aware mostly that people need to be aware which means what happens is that a team that is aware of this starts writing much more starts putting down concepts in much much, much clearer way, uh, way. Uh, if I were to uh, create a new feature Right? and write it down. I would write it down so that everyone, even those that were not in the building when this was discussed, would be able to read it and understand it. And I'm seeing this a lot. Teams that are not in the mentality of remote workers being participating in the project um, are actually putting down things in a much, I would say, chaotic way, whereas things are more discussed. So we say verba volans, skipta manant, right? Words why and what is written in states. Even if it's in a chat, it's there. You can look it up, you can search it. It's not the best medium. Don't use Slack for searches. Like it's a closed source platform and it's horrible, honestly. Um, you know, just, just use Mattermost, please. Um, but um, again, um, you have it written. You have a clear discussion and when you put things in writing, you are being much more clear about what you want to ex describe because you know there is going to be another person interpreting what you're writing. It's not like a discussion between me and you now and I see your expression. Obviously you didn't understand what I said and now I need to explain it again. So I need to be able to describe things in such a way that I'm not going to cause a scandal because we didn't understand each other. I'm not going to make somebody angry because we didn't understand each other. Or you're going to do the wrong thing because I didn't describe it correctly. But to be honest, I would still first do it live. You can do it live, but you are always going to have somebody away. Yeah. So you need to be aware that if you're saying something like, some employee left us, your example, everyone must be notified. This is a mentality thing, and in Germany I'm currently having huge difficulties with this because the mentality of the company is not like that. But again, it's a thing you need to build towards and when we were like doing full-time remote with Rove, my previous client, um, we were doing it through Rove there, that was working really well because the team was in this mindset. So, if there are no more questions, I have just a quick one for the three of you. If you had to pick an ideal solution, what would it be for remote office, location, whatever? Like, would you work for a company that's seven time zones away, but you want to have your own home office across the street? Like, what would you be your ideal work setup? I would 
rent a co-working space with a meeting room only when it's needed. And I wouldn't even have an office for the company. That's not needed, in my opinion. But that's from experience, from a team where this works well. Okay. My preference, I still like to be physically in an office. It actually gets me away from home. Um, I have to care for my wife quite a bit. Uh, time in the office becomes my time. It is that break. It ensures that I'm in contact with the other people in the team uh, and still have that grounding in reality, even if other people I'm working with are remote workers. But would you mind having your grounding. own office like two streets away instead of a long commute? It would be nice if it was 20 minutes away as it was two months ago as opposed to an hour and a half away as it is now. But I still need that away from home time, even if it was a colo office or something like that. I need that separation, I need the grounding of other people to work around me, even if they're not directly working with me. But I do also like the ability to go up to co-workers and answer their questions or peer over my shoulder and say, Mark, what the hell are you doing that for? Don't be an idiot. That type of thing is always very, very useful and I find that physically, face-to-face -face is a lot easier than remotely. And things like designing things, whiteboarding, I don't think there's a decent tech solution for whiteboarding a design other than an actual whiteboard that people can draw on and other people can say, no, that connection to there instead. I like the office okay. work. Um, I prefer uh, if I have a dedicated space for working. Uh, so if I work in a kitchen, it doesn't really work with me. Uh, I always like to learn by going to a library, so I transfer that to my work days. Uh, but I wanted to mention something about teams. Uh, I would prefer the policy to hire teams in our closest time as possible, or at least not to try to connect like San Francisco, Europe, and Australia. Because if you need to sync, be live, then somebody's going to get beaten beaten by the, the hours and I know a few cases where in the end the Australian guy quit and <coughs> said okay I can't leave at 3 a.m. anymore so that's it for me so at least try to keep teams geographically um, time zone wise close uh, if, if possible if you need any um, uh, sync time if not if you can write it down be meticulous about it so then any questions Okay, so one final. How do you convince your partner that working at home doesn't mean you're on holiday? <laughs> uh, I have a room where I don't get disturbed. That's the office. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Really? That is the office. That's not going to get disturbed. That's I have heard more yourself. than a yeah. few stories yeah. about yeah. can you take yeah. the trash yeah. out? Yeah, the washer is yeah. done. Yeah. Can yeah. you do this? <laughs> it's it's an education. Yeah. Yeah. Slowly, steadily, you need to educate also the partners, the people at home, the children, whatever it is. That's how it is. Okay. It's uphill then. Thank you very uh, much, Mary. Thank you all for joining the panel. <laughs> and thank you all for being here.